The Secrets of Technology is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Technology, where we discuss the technology news that's important to you from a uniquely Catholic point of view. And joining me today on the panel are Thomas Senorho. Hey, Thomas. Hey, Dom. And Jack Barazzini. Hey, Jack. Hey, Dom. Uh, folks, I want to tell you about another show on the StarQuest Network you're sure to enjoy called The Secrets of Doctor Who, which is very timely, uh, pun intended, because the <laughs> new season of Doctor Who is just about to drop on, uh, well, BBC if you're in the UK, but also on Disney Plus for everywhere else in the world, featuring the newest Doctor and Jimmy, Father Corey, and I are going to be talking all about it as it airs in June. So get on board with The Secrets of Doctor Who right now, and you can uh, join us as we explore Doctor Who uh, in the new season. And we've also got some great stuff coming up before and after as well. And you can find that wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash Doctor Who. So before we get into our main topics today, uh, Jack, we got a little feedback from a listener. They had a question and uh, I, I, you gave him a great answer. So let me read this question and then you, we could talk about the answer you gave. Uh, Ted Coville emailed in. He said, I purchased a Steam Deck late la last fall and I'm really enjoying it. My decision to purchase the device was influenced was influenced by the recommendations by the team and the positive reviews. I started playing Elder Scrolls V, and that's where I started to see problems. For the part, for the most part, the game works well, and I've not had problems, but sometimes the game locks up. I reboot, and it locks up again. This can happen several times during a session. I changed the setting from online mode to offline mode. That seemed to help a little bit, I think, but it still locks up. Sometimes it doesn't lock up at all. I next purchased Je uh, Star Wars Jedi Survivor. This is not a Steam Deck certified game, and there were warnings when I started playing. Same issue with the locking up, but much more often. So, Jack, you get a lot of experience with Steam Deck and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, manipulating it and modifying the, you know, in, in the software side. What would you say for someone who's, you know, got a Steam Deck or looking to get a Steam Deck and they want to get the most out of the Steam Deck? Um, well, I think the first thing you should do is uh, go through this list of plugins that we have here um they will uh they'll increase the usability of the steam deck there's a lot of little optimizations you can do and there's also plugins that give you rankings for games like based on how well they're going to run um so there's this thing called decky which is the decky loader and it's kind of a front end and a framework for loading in all these plugins um and you can get that uh, at decky.xyz and we'll have those links in the show notes for everyone mm -hmm. Um, and Proton DB is one of the first plugins I would install. It gives you a ranking on the Steam Store and on all your Steam games. Kind of like how, like, if you look at the Steam Store, it'll say if it's certified or not. But that's really all they give you. This one rates it by, like, platinum, gold, bronze, platinum, gold, silver, and bronze, I think, or unsupported. And it also gives you a bunch of FAQs and user reviews with information on what you can do to optimize your game like different settings you can turn on or turn off and stuff like that so that's been really helpful when trying to get stuff to run um, another one is called cryo utilities and this goes through and does a bunch of little optimizations um, on the steam deck that can get your games running better there's also one called storage cleaner and it basically will allow you to clear out all the like extra temporary files that your games will download and that just helps to free up space or if you've got something stuck in memory it, you can clear that out and then just restart and that'll help a lot <clears throat> it's also important to remember there's a lot of there's kind of like a, a sliding scale of compatibility with games like so you got to kind of figure out what annoyances you can put up with and what what ones are going to be like game breaking um a couple other things you can do is for games that have that small text issue. I know that's one of the ones that uh, Skyrim has where it was built for a keyboard and mouse. So you have like text boxes you have to enter in. It's not very often. And then sometimes the text will be unreadable on this Steam Deck screen. Mm. Those things are more of annoyances. But I know Jedi Survivor is one of those games where I think it's just 
it's it's new enough that it's kind of above the limits of what the deck can run. Um, so there's going to be some games that you simply can't get running, but I would definitely recommend checking out uh, Proton DB because it has a lot of uh, settings and a lot of optimizations you can do from other users. Okay. Yeah, I um the one I've done is that Cryo Utilities, and that helped a yeah. lot. I was having a lot of issues, especially with the EA games, uh, the the Star Wars games, and, and that, that sort of thing. Uh, which much of it went away uh, once mm. I did that. I do still occasionally run into problems. Like I ran into a problem where uh, my kids love playing Battlefront, and every time they would load, they would launch Battlefront, it would it would never load. And I finally ended up having to, I, I wiped it out from the drive, and I I did a bunch of stuff. <laughs> I'm not sure which one of those things worked, but eventually <laughs> it, it got it to work. It, uh, but yeah, it, it's. The Steam Deck is still a Linux machine running Windows emulators. And so it's it's never going to be perfect, I think, unless it's a very simple older game. Mm. Um, but but these will yeah. take you a long way to, to, to getting things running. I would also say for EA games, because one of the biggest problems with their games is they have their like EA game thing wrapped around the game where you have to log in with an account and you have to be yeah. online and that's really what causes a lot of those issues so whenever i set up an ea game on my steam deck i actually do it by plugging it into a monitor and using a keyboard and mouse because it's much easier to go through that initial setup and get it working and then you're right. usually able to play no problem so i'd recommend that if you're having trouble with those annoying login screens i uh i usually i have a bluetooth keyboard that i pair to it um, yeah. So I have a full size keyboard and a full size uh, mouse. I do a Bluetooth mouse as well. Um, and that way it just it's so much easier. Uh, and you could actually even, you know, I have mine. Uh, I got an HDMI cable. I hook it to my TV when I want to. I mean, sometimes I just hook it to, to it so to play off of the big screen. But sometimes uh, um, or you could do Steam Link, which is a nice uh, option. Apple, there's actually an Apple TV app called Steam Link that lets you mm -hmm. uh, stream the image from the Steam Deck to the TV. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a little bit laggy, but not not actually all that bad. So uh, it's playable that way. So um, yeah, that way you get a nice big view. Yeah. Oh, one more thing I just thought of. If there are certain games that you want to play that either aren't available on Steam or just don't run on the Steam Deck hardware, you could look into the Xbox Game Pass because there are ways to play that on the Steam Deck. And that's basically one of those streaming services where Ooh. you can play a lot of different games, but they're just going to be streamed to your device. And I've, I haven't done that on the Steam Deck, but I've done it on my computer, which is not a gaming computer, and that's worked really well. And I know that people have gotten that working on Steam Deck. Oh, I'll have to look at that. Because um, that new Star Wars Outlaws game is going to be console only, so... Uh, I really, I really want to Star Wars games. It's, it's I'm always into that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that's cool. That's a good, that's a great idea. Um, awesome. So ho Ted, hopefully that helps you or and other folks. And if you have other questions, we love to, you know, to try to help you best we can on the show. Uh, and uh, so if you get any questions, uh, email them into us at technology at sqpn.com. So our main topic today is something that just kind of showed up. Uh, I forget where the link came from, but uh, someone shared this link to this Atlantic article, uh, the, which is the headline is maybe you missed it, but the Internet died five years ago. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, and, and the, uh, it's just kind of funny. The, um, I love it. <laughs> it's basically an article about this conspiracy theory that exists on the Internet that uh, it's called the dead internet theory, which says that the internet died as a independent entity, you know, uh, as a freewheeling uh, place uh, for with people um, years ago, and that it is now mostly uh, bots and generate and if deep fake generated content uh, propagated by the government or some other you know nefarious people aliens or whatnot to manipulate us and to you know to 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 keep us i don't know whatever whatever you think they're trying to do make us do that's what they're doing and and it really it's not even just like most of the internet is you know like there's a lot of bot traffic or there's a lot of spam bots no the idea is that 
nearly everything online, the people on Twitter, the websites you go to, everything is fake, that the Internet is really dead. Um, and it's fascinating because, well, conspiracy theories are, are often fun, but it's also fascinating to to kind of encounter people who believe some of the most extreme conspiracy theories. But then there's another level in which it's not entirely wrong either. <laughs> and so I wanted to talk to you guys about this. And first, what do you guys think about the dead internet theory and this, this big conspiracy theory? I, I mean, are we real? <laughs> I ask myself that question a lot. But, I, I was gonna say this is this is not this is just the reformulation of an of a very very long standing existential crisis, right? Like the the other minds problem. Yes. I, how do I know that anybody's real? I know I am real, but how do I know anybody else is real? Right. All my knowledge of the world is filtered through my senses, and right, my senses can lie. You can you can see you can see hallucinations. You can feel its hallucinations even and hear things that mm -hmm. aren't there. Um, and if, if I'm just a brain in a vat with data being fed to it, how do I know? Right. I could, it's like the Matrix. Yeah. And, and then you have to ask the question, is this really much different than any other situation where we have this kind of crazy... Uh, I mean, it really comes back to existentialism, right? This is, this is the how do we know what is real and what's not. Mm -hmm. And... And then, like like you said, the danger with this one and in, with all conspiracy theories is that there's enough truth to it that it's really hard to disagree with the the ethos yes. <laughs> of what it's saying, while at the same time going, well, that's obviously not true because I know real people and I have run into them online or, or met them in real life or, you know, chatted with them via video chat. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not, it's, it's difficult. <laughs> but I, the thing I think is most interesting about this is that this conspiracy theory really was just ahead of its time in terms of the problems. Cause mm -hmm. we're getting to the point now with AI where, I mean, I don't think we're at that point yet, but I think we're maybe two or three years away from you could video chat with someone and believe and think they're real and then have them actually not be real. So this is mm -hmm. one of those things where I think it's a conspiracy theory and as with most of those it they vastly overestimate the competence of the government right but <laughs> i mm -hmm. think this is something that could actually become an issue not in the holistic sense of what they're saying but where people are talking to other people who they believe are real and they're completely fabricated now to go back to the people think things are fabricated even though they're real uh, i have actually a real world uh, example of this right here within the star quest production network uh so on jimmy Akin's mysterious world we've often had readers people who read quotes and i do it my wife melanie has done it my daughter isabella has done it and w you know where we read quotes from books or people or whatnot um and we basically we've been recently been expanding that to have other people come in and help out and so in our most recent episode episode 307 on after death communications uh we had uh the wonderful alex murray who is you can hear on the secrets of sacred art podcast and the secrets of middle earth and uh she did those readings for the female voice and we had not one but two people complain that we were using ai voices and it made it very difficult to listen to it was very off-putting and i said <laughs> huh. that's interesting i mean that's that's actually a real person <laughs> and to to their credit uh, the people who read it were very apologetic and very, and they're like, I don't understand why. Now, Alex is a uh, American living in Britain who used to live in Norway, and she admits that some of her diction may be kind of off a little bit, like like uh, like she mm. she's intentionally had to intentionally flatten her diction, so it maybe comes across as a little artificial accent, hmm. maybe. But um, but it's it's this this idea that at, at this point in time. I think people think more things are bad than they are. Like we're right. we're primed yeah. to expect that something is a scam, a fake, a go, uh, a catfish. Uh, what's the other one? The uh, gaslight. You know, we're primed to mm -hmm. expect that sort of thing now. Well, I, I will say that I've been accused of being a um, of being an AI bot <laughs> writing uh, occasionally in emails that I write because I. I history of being an English teacher and having, you know, 
a broader vocabulary that I'm careful not to overuse <laughs> because I'm used to dealing with children. So <laughs> like there's a lot of a lot of interesting stuff going on there. So I'm very careful about the way I phrase things and the way I word things. And so it sometimes comes across in a very stilted way. Uh, but then the, the 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 one that bothers me is like when you search online for information and it's about an, a common enough topic, you'll land on one of those pages that's just obviously word vomit. Yes. And it's obviously non-human word vomit <laughs> right. just to fill the page. And it's about the question that you asked, but it's not exactly about the question that you asked. <laughs> And it's always like a website that's like the times of some random town in Illinois. Like there's exactly, all these yeah. old news sites that have these articles <laughs> on them now. We talked about that on a recent episode of this show about how there's this problem of um, all of these community newspapers that have closed up shop and all their domain names being bought up by somebody. And they, they try to track down who actually is behind all this. And then these fake news sites get put up in their place which uh, as the article as the Atlantic article points out always seem to have articles about the super moon and the blue moon and the pink moon and like mm-hmm. lots of articles about the moon like for, like something out there thinks that we that everyone wants to know about the moon um yeah there is a lot of garbage out there this i mean that's that's part one of the truths in this conspiracy theory is there's a lot of fake bot traffic on the internet there's a lot of fake websites and fake accounts on on x and 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 other social media um you go onto youtube it doesn't take long to find even like uh generate you know fake generated bot videos that that are just Mm -hmm. crazy like drug fueled fever dreams like they are wild bizarre (laughs) (laughs) um and another part of the problem is we are subject to algorithms you know, on social media, especially that do encourage us to engage in the same co- kind of content over and over. Oh, you looked at this. Here's some more of that. And here's a whole avalanche more of the same thing. Mm-hmm. And, and we get siloed into these, you know, these uh, bunkers that, you know, that just get filled with the same content. And it's easy to say, see, this is just boss, you know, dumping stuff on me. And, and it's yeah. like, it's 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 hard to it's hard to say you know that's not true because that is happening i just don't think it's as prevalent it, i don't think it's like it's not the extreme theory where the internet is 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 dead and it's only this other thing but it is a problem yeah mm-hmm. I, I will say I'm I'm reading an interesting book right now. It's called Techno Feudalism uh, and and how capitalism died or how it killed capitalism. One of the two, and um, the 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 basic f- uh, theory that's coming out of this is the fact that there are these ne- new feudal lords that are uh, controlling the internet, and it's you know your your big guys, the the ones you right. expect Fang. Amazon and and whatever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that that they actually have gotten to the point where they are they own kind of our thought space and our, our existence online in a way that uh, we can't, we're, we're digital serfs now and we, we serve them. They, they, they grant us the ability to use the market, but they extract from us a heavy tax in doing so. And um, it's a really interesting book. The, the author is, uh, is a Greek, uh, a Greek politician. And so he's got a lot of, uh, kind of out there theories too uh, so so it's it's exciting uh, uh getting but you, but when you read through some of the the more out there uh concepts it, it, it he makes a good point about this and I, and I feel like that's kind of what this uh, the the best outcome of thinking of this dead internet theory is to say hey maybe i need to be more technically literate in the things that i'm reading online but then also to start being leery about how much of my online existence is owned by someone else's opinion of what I should be seeing. Mm-hmm. There was a, yeah. I mean, there was a time on the internet way back when, when, you know, we had blogs and we had um, even before that BBS is that we ran ourselves that you could dial into. And, you know, there were, mm-hmm. there were spaces that were not corporate, were not owned by other people that we had our own servers. And I suppose even then, you know, the backbone of the internet was still a corporate thing, 
Uh, but but even more so now, I mean, you just can't you there's nowhere to go online that isn't somebody else's space, really. You know, people yeah. don't generally, you know, own their own websites anymore. Not like even before that long ago, um, we're we're generally encountering each other on TikTok, Facebook, X, Google, you know, YouTube, uh, the you know, the, the those big platforms. And we we get fed everything, Amazon and Netflix and whatnot. Um, you know, there a lot of science fiction posits like this future where corporations have overtaken governments as the rulers of mm-hmm. the planet. And as you see these mega corporations kind of s- squat across borders, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and you see the EU trying to regulate Google, which is in every country and it's so huge or Apple or Facebook or whatever, you know, it, it starts to sink in that it wouldn't take much for these companies to get so big where they just say, I refuse to follow your laws, you know, mm-hmm. and we're, we're the feudal Lords, like you mentioned, and yeah, yeah. Y- you have to abide by our rules. And how do you stop them? That's the, that's the kind of scary thing. Like right. what, what the butler <laughs> do you do? God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, especially when they've got like, they've got a server farm in the U S and a server farm in East Europe. If you go take the server farm in the U.S., well, they just roll everything over to East Europe, and now that's where it's running from, right. and then they just move it to somewhere else after that. And then they, so, yeah. they turn off access to your citizens, and the citizens say, mm-hmm. hey, I want access back. I'm voting you out of office if you don't stop messing with my <laughs> Facebook account, you know? Exactly. Yeah. It's scary. People, you're right. Education is a key aspect to this. Um, mm-hmm. And also a realization that not all of life needs to be online and not all of life is online. Mm -hmm. I know so many people who don't spend any time on social media. You know, I mean, obviously I, I know a lot of people who are on social media. This is where I work and live. Uh, But I, I recognize so many people who they, they don't spend their days on Facebook or Twitter or, you know, these other spaces. And they're better for it in some ways. I mean, you know, it's not that all these things are terrible, but you know, they don't, they're not bound to it. On the other hand, I see a lot of young people who spend all their time in these places. Mm -hmm. And that, that kind of scares me because sure. You know, when the generation that's over the age of 35 is gone and that generation has grown up, will they have learned in the interim not to, put so much of themselves into these spaces owned by these companies. Mm. Well, yeah, no, I, I, a good testament to what, what the algorithm does is whenever you get onto a new uh, social media account and they first peg you just for your age, uh, gender, and they decide to throw things at you that fit that age and gender, and you're like, whoa, this is not the space I wanted to be in. <laughs> <laughs> it's been my experience with TikTok where it's just like, I, I started my account and it knows how old I am. It knows I'm yep. a male and the stuff that it's throwing at me. I'm like, yep, I need yeah. to work this algorithm. I so I started Instagram, like finding yeah. good creators. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Instagram's the same way. Uh, it keep, uh, well, the interesting thing is I, I push the algorithm in a direction that I want to go to. Um, let's say, you know, barbecue, smoked meats and world history, world war history, you know, cause I'm a mm-hmm. male over the age of 40 and uh, it, it, but every once in a while it wants to push in some, you know, young scantily clad women so, you know that's that's mm-hmm. it, it always it always wants to do that and it's it's almost like the you know i'm not one to to go here but it is almost like the tool of the devil in that sense yeah. it's, it is you mm-hmm. have to actively stay virtuous online you know it, it's it, it is uh it is a constant battle that you can't give into um yeah it, it's fascinating to to see how that works although i am hopeful how often it's wrong in the things it shows me. Mm-hmm. Although it may be a double fake where it's like, we need to show them the wrong stuff every once in a while. So they don't think we, <laughs> we know more than we do. Uh, or they think, yeah, they think we know less than we do. Well, no, actually that worries me because that's part of the algorithm. Just testing the waters, right? Where it's yeah. like, well, do they like this thing too? Okay. Well, how about this thing? And mm-hmm. so the, it's just serving you up random things oh. on a platter. that, like, well, other people like this. Other people like this person like this thing. So let's try this out. It's training itself. And yeah, Yeah. and that's exactly what it is. So it's getting smarter. That's great. (laughs) (laughs) There was that one time back in 2020 when Facebook was showing me ads for portable morgues. 
Oh, and like and and, <laughs> wow. and uh and also like um uh, guns and other stuff and I'm like what is it you think I am Facebook <laughs> a vampire slayer yeah I think I'm about to go on a rampage or something um so anyway back to the dead internet theory uh it is um it is true that uh there are a lot of bots and AI is starting to, you know, the, the various, you know, uh, machine learning chat generators that we have, ChatGPT, Gemini, and um, Microsoft Copilot and the like. We're starting to see them fill some spaces up. And one of the things I, I, I really thought was funny, this was from a Forbes article on the same, the same thing, um, was how uh, pe- people are filling up Amazon listings they're just they're sh- it. They've proven that how many Amazon listings are just shovelware of generated content because uh, mm-hmm. there was like a, a series of listings where it says, "Oh, I'm trying to find it now." Um, it was hysterical. Uh, the, the all of the uh, the listings were. I'm sorry, but I cannot fulfill this request. It goes against OpenAI use policy. My purpose is to provide helpful and respectful information to users. In Brown. <laughs> that was the like the name of the thing like these people aren't even paying attention they're just saying generate nonsense and post it and and they weren't mm-hmm. even paying attention to what was coming at the other end um would you buy a three a 325 dollar i don't know looks like an end table or something with that on it like man <laughs> talk about putting a red flag up so i know not to buy something yeah so it's just crazy. lazy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And that's that's a lot of Amazon, frankly. That's a whole nother conversation we can have mm. about how much of Amazon listings are just junk, just like just n- terrible stuff that's just shoveled on there. Um yeah, that yeah, there's a lot of that. This is a conversation we could continue to have just about how much of the internet mm. is 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 nonsense um out there and scams. Yeah. Uh, so that's all uplifting. <laughs> Anything else we want to say about the dead internet theory before we move on? I, I think that the comforting thing here, and we're, we're going to, we're going to revisit this yes. because one of our headlines comes kind of back to this, yep. the same kind of uh, concept. Um, but I think one of the comforting things here is that we are getting to a point where we are all becoming overfed on the amount of information that's available to us. And that's a good thing because one, it's causing us to be more weary or more wary consumers, more uh, aware of what we're reading mm-hmm. and more conscious about the intake that we have. But it's also causing us to disconnect. And we're, we're all starting to think very seriously about uh, stepping away, stepping outside, touching some grass. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and that's, this is going to push that more because our our kids are growing up. My kids are growing up in an era when it's so overwhelming for them just from the get go that they are retreating to reliable sources of information. So actually printed sources of information. My kids love the encyclopedia because mm-hmm. they can go find an answer there and they know it's the answer. <laughs> right. They know it's not uh, some made up junk or they don't have to wade through this, you know, eight page long a uh, thing that just keeps scrolling forever and ever to find a decent answer. They can go right to the encyclopedia, look for the highlighted words and there they are. Uh, so I like that aspect of it. I think that's, that's the good part of this internet dying yeah. <laughs> on us kind of thing. And I have, I have, I have noticed uh, kind of along the lines of what you were talking about, Thomas with um, my son is seven. So I've, decided to start like teaching him how to like do electronics projects and coding and stuff. And the most effective way of doing that has been buying those physical project books mm-hmm. and yeah. then using like a old laptop that's not connected to the internet to do all these projects and that you get way more. I think the information retention is just much higher when you're working with physical paper and just like one focus thing rather than let's just watch this YouTube video that tells us how to do it. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Yeah translating from written text on a page to action is very different from just physically aping the steps that I see in a mm-hmm. video. I agree with yeah. that. That's true for me too. And you know, Th- Thomas, about what you were saying about like p- people are 
are getting warier of the things that they, you know, when I see people go, oh, yeah, Facebook is listening to me through my phone or Apple or whoever. And, you know, sometimes I when I want to see ads for something, I just yell it at the phone 10 times or and I'm like, it, it, you know, I want to say that's really not how it works. It's actually the reason you <laughs> see the ads you do is because of your behavior and they have the. You, but I'm like, you know what? Maybe it's OK if they think that. Maybe right. if, maybe people yeah. should distrust their phones and their speak, you know, Bluetooth speakers and technology a little more than we do. Um, you know, mm-hmm. even if it's probably a little wrong, maybe that's probably for the best. Yeah, <laughs> just saying. I think so. All right. Uh, all right. Let's move on to some headlines. But before we do that, I want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of technology, including Robert H., Father Stephen W., Carrie O., Christy R. and James M. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of technology and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So our first headline is one of these um, cautionary tales. Uh, The headline from boingboing.net is uh, Innocent St. Louis Family Terrorized in SWAT Raid over stolen AirPods. So what happened here is that in St. Louis last May, I think it was in 20, yeah, May of 2023, uh, there was a carjacking and some AirPods were in the car and AirPods have find my, and the person who's, who car was carjacked told the police. So they opened up the find my app and they, they saw that it was at this house in this neighborhood. And on that basis got a, a no knock search warrant, or I don't know if it was no knock or not, but it was a search warrant with a SWAT team that busted down the door, came, came, you know, barging in, ransacked the house, put holes in the walls and in the ceiling and, and terrorized this poor family. And in the end, it turns out the AirPods were in the street in front of the house, because that's probably where the, the carjackers threw them out the window because they mm-hmm. knew that they was fine my on AirPods. Um, what do you guys think of this? I mean, this is t- terrible. You and I would know. <laughs> don't rely on uh, Find My to be that accurate, <laughs> right? I want to know why they decided this was the best way to handle the situation, no matter what. That's pretty much <laughs> my take on it. This whole, the whole thing, just uh, me. Yeah, it doesn't describe the carjacking itself, but I I assume maybe it was a very violent carjacking. I don't know or that there were guns in the car. Like that's the only thing I can assume is that there were some kind of weapons in the car. And that, that means that going in to collect the, the stolen goods would mean that you were going into somewhere where there were weapons. But even then it's just like, it seems very, very overkill. <laughs> the way the article reads, it's almost like the AirPods were the only thing that were stolen. And <laughs> yeah. like, like it would have been cheaper just to buy the person a new set of AirPods and just forget about it. <laughs> well, and I think, uh, the kind of the vibe I get from the article is that it downplays the carjacking part and yeah. partially probably just for political reasons, but probably also for in sensational headline clicks. Like this wasn't about the AirPods. The AirPods were used to locate, to try to locate where the carjacking had gone and they got it wrong. And that is also a big mess up on their part. Right. Yeah. If you click through uh, to the original uh, you know, local paper uh, story, it says that the carjacking ha- happened 12 hours prior, 16 miles away. At around 6 a.m., two brothers were leaving Waffle House because um, that's when you leave Waffle House. It's 6 a.m. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Waffle House. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that was, it was probably a long night for those guys. And they were carjacked by a group of six people. Two of the carjackers wow. took off in the brother's Dodge Charger, which is a suit up car. And it said that the... Um, the application for a search warrant said they had reason to believe that firearms, ammunition, holsters, and other mm-hmm. firearm related material were inside. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, yeah, that's what, that's what I was thinking. But, but still, it's just like, it, it, there's so little due diligence based on the find my app, right? Yeah. Like you, you can't base your whole, <laughs> your whole police force on the find my app. You, you no, can't it's not. just bust into a house based on what find my says. It just, this is, happens too often. We've talked about it before. Like people had, have had 
uh, other people show up at their house, you know, like, give me back my phone. It's I know it's in here. And it's like, uh, it's not that accurate. And, and Apple and Google have to do a better job of letting people know, like, it's sort of in this area, probably. But that's not 100 percent. Don't go mm-hmm. <laughs> violent on people based on this. Uh, you know, it's I think crazy. that they're like based on the amount of stories that we see about this kind of thing that I imagine there's going to, at some point there needs to be some sort of legislation that says find my is not allowed to be used as a police investigation tool or admissible in court as evidence. Mm-hmm. Or at least the sole basis or the primary yeah. basis, you know, they, yeah. they should have, okay, find my says the head air pods are here. Okay. Let's do some more police work. Let's look so, on the ground, right? Or do some surveillance. <laughs> Do we see anybody yeah. going in and out of this house that may look like the suspects? Is the stolen car nearby? You know, <laughs> right. Or see if we can locate the actual AirPods, you know, in the area and narrow it down to the maybe the house itself. And I mean, it's just it feels like in this case, they just didn't bother doing anything except say, that's mm-hmm. the one. Let's break in. It just, oh, yeah, I, you're right. I mean, it's what's going to happen is the, so this this family is suing the um, police department uh, in, in you know, for ransacking their house. Good. <laughs> Didn't even repair the damage. You know, they, they had to right. do it themselves. Um, but I should I wonder if people are going to start suing the manufacturers. They're going to sue Apple or Google or whoever Tile or whoever, you know, the various companies are and, you know, get them to do a better job of not necessarily improving the technology i'm sure they want to do that but a better job of letting making sure people know like police know you cannot rely on this as the primary means of determining where something is Mm -hmm. so uh speaking of apple uh this other one story is also related to apple um apple has relented and has suddenly started allowing uh game emulators in its app stores uh you can now download a uh, let's see a Game Boy emulator, a Commodore sixty four emulator, and run them on your iPad, your iPhone, uh, your M one Mac, or even Vision Pro. Um, although to be fair, you could always there are, there's always been game emulators you could run on a Mac because it's not you know walled garden. You can run you know third party software on there. You'd have to get it from Apple, but uh, it's kind of fascinating. Apple had kind of treated game emulators as piracy soft you know software for a Mm -hmm. long time uh but they suddenly changed their mind what do you think i am glad that people have iphones and ipads can finally play games i've got an android (laughs) so this this has never been a problem for me old news (laughs) yes i know for for android folks that's not not been an issue um yeah Yeah. i i you know what it boils down to is is an emulator is not a problem Mm if you know they just you just have to it's it's the software that you're running on it. Is it right. your software? Is it pirated software? But that's always been an issue with computers. So it is interesting that this comes right on the heels of Nintendo suing Yuzu, who they made a emulator. It's a Switch emulator and also a Nintendo DS emulator, and they just got completely shut down by Windows or by Nintendo. And I think that's probably because the Switch is their current system. But mm-hmm. I'm I would be interested to see if Nintendo becomes more aggressive, more aggressive than they already are, to be uh, honest. Yeah. They're pretty aggressive already. <laughs> yeah. With uh now that Apple is doing it, because with Android, like there are emulators on the Android store, but the best ones are the ones that you have to sideload yourself. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. yeah. Interesting. I wonder there's been some speculation whether it's related to the uh, EU's requirement that Apple set up an ability to sideload outside of the app store and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, whether it signals a sea change within Apple's thinking about apps and what it allows in and, and doesn't, I mean, all of these apps still have to go through the approval process and they still have to, you know, um, have the privacy guidelines and all that sort of stuff. So it's not like a free for all at the moment, but um, mm-hmm. it is, it, it's sort of an interesting indicator of where maybe things are changing a little bit here that the a little bit more open um all right so thomas i think this is the article we were talking about uh, that was related to the dead internet theory article uh this is an article from sciencealert.com 
And it says, uh, AI could explain why we're not meeting any aliens, a wild study proposes. Now, that headline's a little misleading. It's not that, like, ChatGPT is explaining to us. Let me, let me start <laughs> from, the, from the, the basic. There's a, <laughs> there's a theory called the Fermi Paradox, which um, it's the discrepancy between the apparent high likelihood of advanced civilizations existing due to the number of stars in the universe um, and how many must be like Earth with the habitable uh, planets and the total lack of evidence that they exist. Although I would say there might be some evidence that they're out there, but you know, you know that's, that's, that's a uh, controversial theory. You know, we'll listen to Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World for more of that. Um, but there are many theories or proposed why there's this discrepancy, why there's no evidence of other alien civilizations. And one of the ideas is the great filter. And this is, a hypothesis that says that there's there are there's the high likelihood of a cataclysmic event occurring to prevent intelligent life from becoming interplanetary, whether it's a nuclear war, an asteroid that wipes out all life, you know, supernovas, that sort of thing. This theory says that AI is that uh, is that great filter event where once AI reaches becomes artificial super intelligence think Terminator, think the Matrix, that uh, basically is the end point of, of civilization and it progresses no further, it dies off in every instance. What do you think of this? This is kind of interesting. It's very pessimistic look, uh, way of looking at things. It's, it's also very, uh, the, the thing that really gets me about this one is the nuclear war one has always bothered me because, uh, you know, it's it's it suffers from the same problem I'm about to describe, but it, it bothers me less than this one. And, and the reason is because this is a very self-important uh, filter event, mm -hmm. right? Like, of course, every civilization that comes to the point where it's going to become intelligent and reach space will develop exactly the same industrial complex with the same computing technology that we do because it's the only way to do it or it's the best way to do it because we did it. You know? Right. And it, it just bothers me so much that like uh, this would be the, the filter. Now, I get it. But the funny thing about the filter is that there's always different things to point at. Like it's the, it, you can always get, oh, it's climate change that, that must cause the problems. It's the, so you can always look for the next end of the world event as the great filter. Um, but it, it's so uh, self-important to say that it must be something that we're doing that causes the or, the, or that these intelligent races are doing that cause the, the great filter to come about. It's the bumpy head alien theory, which is. Because yep. in Star Trek, all aliens uh, are look just like us, except they have different kinds of bumps in their foreheads, and their societies yep. <laughs> are just like ours, except they have <laughs> funny names and funny hats. Like, right? And so yep. I think exactly. I think uh, like some of these scientists have kind of fallen into this trap of thinking sci-fi is a reflection. What do you think, Jack? I think that well, this is just my general problem with the Fermi paradox is that most people who write about it seem to misunderstand it that it's just like an interesting thought experiment it doesn't really mean anything because you can plug in whatever numbers you want into it and get wildly different results mm -hmm. um but i guess my, my main thing that it, it makes me think about is everyone should go read uh both the three body problem and the uh mm -hmm. children of time by adrian tchaikovsky if you want to see very mm -hmm. very interesting uh, explorations of alien civilizations that are wildly different from earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't read the three body problem, but I watched the Netflix series and, uh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Mm. It was, I, I really liked it. Um, I'm, I, I'm interested in reading the book now, but, um, yeah, I mean, the problem with, with the, the Fermi paradox is the way people approach it is, well, how would we know? Like maybe they are yeah. out there, but, <laughs> They're so far away. How would we even know they're there? It's like saying, mm -hmm. oh, there must not be anybody who lives in Asia because, well, I can't see them. Like, <laughs> they're so far away. Yeah. Like, how would I, like, how would I know? I mean, it's like yeah. um, people in Europe are thinking that the, the, the world is flat and you're going to sail off the edge, you know? It's like I mean, a the, the really cute thing. Uh, this, the, the really cute thing yeah. here too is that we haven't even made it outside of our own planet's orbit like we, yeah. we've not escaped our own planet's gravitational right. pull so for us to say 
there must not be anything out there. It's like, how could we possibly (laughs) make that assumption? Right. And and I really like Star Trek's take on it too, where it's until we discover uh, faster than light travel, the, the other races that have already discovered faster than light travel are not going to interact with us out of, out of a sense of preserving us so that we can, so that we can develop that on our own if we will, or if, or if not, we'll, we'll die out the way that, that, um, the way that we live. And I really like that idea. I think that's something that, that holds a lot of merit because you know, you look at our society today, there's still uh, tribes that exist in regions that are very separate from, uh, from society. And we've declared them world heritage. They, mm-hmm. they are supposed to be left alone. And that's the general consensus is that we're going to leave them alone to do what they will, because that's their livelihood and their lifestyle. And it's not our place to walk in and mess with them. Right. Yep. Earth, Earth is the uh, Sentinel Island of the galaxy currently. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They probably come and look at us, but we can't see them because we're much more primitive. Exactly. Yeah. We also have a sample site. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, we have, we're, All this stuff is like based on a sample size of one. Like we know about our planet. We don't know anything else about anyone else. So we can't say anything else about it, really. Mm -hmm. If we had at least met one other civilization, then we could compare and say, okay, so they're like that and we're like this. So it's still a very small sample size, but at least it tells us something. But you're right. Like, mm-hmm. All of these are valid points. We we barely have made it outside the order of our. We haven't made, gone put any people past our moon. Although didn't uh, SpaceX well, did that? Yeah, but uh, well, the Russians might have. But that's a different topic. <laughs> Accidentally, not on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've heard that one too. We should do that in mysterious world. That would be a good topic. Um, so in in any in any case, uh, this physicist. I mean. I don't know. I mean, I I don't want to you know slag him because you're know, based on the one thing, but it just goes to show just because someone has a degree in physics doesn't mean they've thought things through and whatnot. Um, yeah, the, the, there is the, the we do need to be wary of artificial intelligence getting out of control and doing you know and, and being used to, as a tool that is dangerous, like a lot of other things. But it's the scary thing of du jour, and mm-hmm. you know. 50 years ago, it was ice ages and nuclear weapons, and now it's climate change and artificial intelligence. So um, I'm I'm not worried about an extinction event 200 years after the Industrial Revolution began due to artificial intelligence. So, um, all right. Our last headline is on this uh, story about a backdoor that was discovered that someone was trying to slip into a ve- very basic part of Linux, uh, the XZ backdoor. What's going on with this? <laughs> you want to go, Thomas? <laughs> I'll, I'll go. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So th- this is, this is really cool. Cause it's like so much of my nerdness comes out. <laughs> <of> this <one. laughs> um, so, so this is, this is an open source project. That's kind of at the root of a lot of what you do in Linux. So it's, um, the XZ is like zip. So if you, if you, if you know zip files, you know, something similar to the way that like an XZ file works. And, uh, what was happening was that we don't actually know who is in charge of XZ. It's, a persona that's in charge of it, but it's been around for so long that it's probably not the same person, but that persona is still in charge of it. And there was some, some stuff happening to the code. There were some changes that were made to the code that were going to allow uh, a backdoor using really, really clever procedure uh, based on key checking and fallbacks inside of the Linux kernel that have existed forever. And, uh, it was really neat, very, very subtle. And it was discovered because it's open source. So this is my favorite part of it. It's like, everybody's like, well, open source is really dangerous. Well, yes, it is, but it's really cool because everybody gets to read the code. And uh, a, a guy at Microsoft discovered this, a software engineer discovered this uh, code change before it got committed and distributed. And what was, what was happening was whoever was doing this was doing it very, very gradually and very carefully to try and avoid exactly this kind of detection. But when you have as many eyes on this kind of basic product as you do, 
it it gets caught fortunately like this one did uh so it didn't actually make it into the wild but it would have been really really devastating because it's essentially like any packages that you got were going to be able to be hijacked and used as uh, a basis to bounce off of and uh get access to your computer yeah and, and the reason that would be so bad is i i I don't know how many people realize it, but the entire internet runs on Linux servers. So it's not mm-hmm. just your hobbyist desktop is going to get messed up. It's the internet could be destroyed. <laughs> It'd be really dead right. then. I like to imagine in my uh, fever dreams as a thriller military or a spy thriller author um, that this was like the China has this huge department of hackers. So does North Korea. So does Russia. So one of them, you know, started like just the story of how this happened like in 2021 this user made their first known commit to the project and then uh to a project not the same one um but uh no one knows at the time but it got them in the door and then the next year they submitted a patch to xzutils and then almost immediately a never before seen participant someone who just joined says last Colin, the, who is an actual person, the longtime maintainer of XUTils, well, he hasn't been active enough. He needs to bring in this guy to be a co, uh, uh, whatever, co additional developer on the project. And then some other people who also had never been active before, they joined in and said, yeah, they should. And so they, he did. And then this person in January 2023 made their, a, a, their first change to XZ Utils, and then they gradually started making very subtle changes that opened up the door to them being able to make the big change without being detected. And I'm like, this is like spy thriller level stuff. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, wild, it really is. To, to, it's so devious. I'm thinking it's either that or it's like some one of the those big Russian uh, cyber hacking conglomerates. Which like mm-hmm. Russian organized crime actually went out and hired a bunch of cyber hackers and uh, or otherwise co opted them or whatever. Um, that's where a lot of this ransomware stuff comes from the the big money stuff. Um, mm-hmm. So it's fascinating to think about who might be actually behind this and how close we just came to like you said an apocalyptic event where someone could have eventually if the you know once this propagated out had a backdoor into any web server any server on the internet yeah i love how it was discovered by the microsoft developer which now think about this as i'm talking about it as like a scene in a christopher nolan movie because that's what it needs to be now the spy thriller (laughs) he was he was doing testing on a a postgres uh sql databases and he noticed that there was uh, like it was taking a few more cycle counts than it usually did on the CPU. So it was like this minuscule, minuscule, like uptick in CPU cycle counts. And he's like, Oh, that's weird. And that's what started him down finding out what was actually causing that. It was just like crazy. <laughs> Thank God for nerds. <laughs> just so everybody is comfortable. Yeah. Just, I was just going to say, just so everybody's comfortable with the fact that that, that is like my everyday existence. <laughs> they were like, this took like two extra CPU cycle counts, but that turns into like nine extra hours worth of work because yeah. when you're running, you know, thousands of calls a second. It, mm-hmm. it's, that's that it adds up. It adds up. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. You want every cycle counts. Uh, so kind of wild. Uh, thanks for bringing that to my attention. That was uh, it's like, I mean, when you think about it, you dig past the very technical stuff. It, it's a cool spy story. And yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, All right, so those are our headlines, and let's move on to our picks of the week. Jack, uh, you're up first. What's your pick this week? My pick of the week, uh, as ironic as it may be, uh, because of all the time we talked about (laughs) AI on this show, uh, is actually Microsoft Copilot, which I'm surprised I'm positively reviewing a Microsoft product, but I've been using it a lot recently um, as I've been doing some uh, development work and some uh, IT work, and it's actually really, really useful. Like, it just pops up in the little panel on the side, and I can ask it technical questions. Like, I was doing something in Vim, and I wanted, like, a you know, a cheat sheet of all the Vim commands and it gives me that or I had some issues generating some certs and I got it to give me the steps and just it's 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 like conversational search and it gives you the information you need and then you can act on it and I don't have to go 
like you said earlier, Dom, scrolling through Stack Overflow to find what I need. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. So I've been surprised by how helpful it is and how unobtrusive it is otherwise. Like, I know a lot of people are hating on Windows 11, but I think the way they've integrated Copilot so far, at least, has is very useful and very helpful, especially for technical things like that. So I definitely recommend it. It's If you have a Windows 11 computer, it's on there, so you don't need to go buy it or anything, but check it out and don't don't let the name Microsoft put you off from it. <laughs> I'm just waiting for them to make a clippy skin for it. That's, <laughs> that's, that's what I want. Hey, it looks like <laughs> you're trying to do to. a thing. <laughs> <laughs> you can actually, there's, I think there's a Copilot app for the iPhone and, and that sort of thing too, so you, it's it's not just for windows i mean it's really useful because it's right there on the windows uh taskbar right it so it i mean mm -hmm. it's yeah. right there on the screen um but you can use copilot and cop underneath copilot is gpt4 i mean that's yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah right it is just microsoft's implementation of chat gpt so that's yeah, awesome i mean we were talking before the show just about how we are both you know finding new uses for it all the time i use it every day literally to help me do the podcast to make summaries and uh, juice up my uh, social media posts and that sort of stuff. Um, and just, you know, I've, I've used it to run thought experiments in a conversational way and, mm -hmm. and, you know, go back and forth or that sort of thing. And I'm just really looking forward to the day when it has that real time search function where I can, where it, it, it knows everything that's on the internet now, as opposed to the last time they trained it six months ago or whatever. Um, and it stops hallucinating, which is, which is a real, still an issue, uh, where it makes up stuff. Uh, so once we, once we get to that point, it'll be really useful. Uh, Thomas, oh, it'll be more useful. Uh, Thomas, what's your pick this week? All right. So m mine's kind of a, an advice piece. Um, I've been, I, I have been wrestling with this for years and I had no idea. <laughs> um, so my wife uses iDevices. She's, she's an Apple uh, user. She really has gotten really into it. She's had a, an iPhone forever. You are a lucky uh, man. She just got, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> well, see that. So that's the thing. She, she got an iWa or she got the, the watch and then she got an iPad and she was using them on the regular. And we were realizing that a lot of the people that were texting us about things that the kids were doing were expecting me to get texts and I was not getting the texts. She was getting the texts. And what was happening was I was the owner of the, uh, I account. So when we started buying these devices, I already had an Apple account. So we just threw them onto my account. Um, cause I wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't need them for myself, but she could just use the account that I had. Well, it turns out that if you are messaging an iPhone from an iPhone, uh, even if you have the person's number in, very often it will go directly to the email instead that's associated with the account. Right. And so all of the messages that were intended to go to both of us were going just to her uh, twice, but not showing up as if they were twice. And um, it took us a long while to figure that out. Right. Like I said, it's been happening for years. <laughs> Didn't realize it. My dad was bothered by it enough that he just got WhatsApp and started messaging me on WhatsApp <laughs> instead. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, that's, uh, I've, we finally figured it out. And I just want to commend Apple for how easy it is to change your account information. Mm -hmm. So it, it took, it, they verified everything. So it wasn't like it was so easy that a hacker could do it and I wouldn't have known. Uh, but it was really just simple to go on and click the button, change the, the email address. It verified it with my email. I just clicked the verification link and then everything was good to go. Uh, and it, it was, it was really simple, made it a very easy process and changed it on all of the devices pretty quickly. And now uh, we're up and running and I can actually get the messages from the people that are supposed to go to me. <laughs> nice. Before they had family sharing, this was a very common thing. People would mm -hmm. use one Apple account for the family or whatever, because then they wouldn't have to buy apps twice and that sort of thing. But this is a sort of problem because, they, you know, Apple wants us so that when you send an iMessage, it goes to all your devices, not just your phone. But if you send it to just the phone number, that's the only place it's going. So if you have an an uh, iCloud account associated with your iPad or whatever, it'll send it to those the, to the account on those. And that's, yeah, you're right. So your phone number is, was still associated with that account. So you needed to get all her onto her own, like separate the phone number mm -hmm. essentially. So, um, and Apple to their credit 
when they came out with family sharing and all that sort of stuff, they knew this was a problem, which is why they did family sharing and were ready on day one to help people separate things out. So you're right. I mean, that is, it, it is, I've gone through this myself and uh, Pat Scott helps people with this all the time. <laughs> I know she's like, this yeah. is a, a, a regular occurrence. So uh, that's a good, good thing to remember is, you know, if you are still sharing an Apple account with somebody, it's time to, to go your own way to at least to, and maybe just even do family sharing, but separate mm-hmm. things out. That's good. Uh, all right. So my pick this week is an iPad case uh, that I got for my daughter. She has an uh, iPad. Uh, I think it's ninth generation, whatever. One of the, the iPad, not air, not pro um, full size, uh, 10.2 inch. And she wanted to, to make sure that it had, a keyboard and that's been an issue is is a case is a case but a keyboard case unless you're paying the massive money for the apple keyboard case which is way more than it and i i would want to pay um you know you you end up with a lot of the janky things and the the bluetooth thing is is the is the issue is because would you you know you either if if it doesn't use a smart connector smart connector is almost like being physically plugged in it is, phys- you know, physically plugged in and it's got yeah. that responsiveness. But if you go with a Bluetooth, you know, a lot of these Bluetooth cases, the the connectivity is slow. It takes forever for it to wake up. You have to tap keys and wait for it to connect and all that sort of thing. So we wanted something pretty good. And so uh, we got this one and it's worked out really well for her. it's the speaking of AI generated names, the Boruan uh, new <laughs> iPad keyboard case with lots of you know, descriptors and the thing. I'll put a link in the show notes, of course. Uh, and it's $26. In fact, there's a 5% coupon on it. So it's even less than that. And um, it's got, um, uh, let me see here. I'm trying to, I've got an issue with my, with Safari, where with uh, Amazon, where um, the images disappear, the product images disappear after like 30 seconds. I, I don't know why. It's really weird. But it's backlit. The keys are backlit. There is a slot for the uh, Apple Pencil to be slotted in. This is uh, the the kind that doesn't have the magnetic pencil. It's the old style where it sticks in the side. But there's a slot for it to lock in. Um, and it, so it's a really nice keyboard. And the key and the battery lasts forever. I mean, the, you know, I I got this for her last September, and I think she's maybe charged it once, if that. <laughs> I mean, it's really been mm, nice. pretty good. So, uh, and for the price, it's really really good price. So uh, I like that the keyboard's removable too. That's yes. that's a feature that is very very under underappreciated in some of these. When the keyboard's built into the thing, it's very complicated to do stuff with it. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's it's sort of it's velcroed, so you can velcro it, and so and then you've got this flat surface. That's the key. That's the uh, iPad cover that you can you can still prop up the iPad without the keyboard. Uh, but and then you can actually put the keyboard in your lap or move it somewhere else and still use it because it's Bluetooth. It doesn't need to be physically connected. So nice. Yeah, it's good. Uh, I recommend it. So that uh, does it for this uh, this episode. And uh, we would love to hear from you and what you thought of any part of our discussion. Uh, you, you, you're free to speculate whether we're actual people or not or just deep fakes. <laughs> yeah, you can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash technology or the StarQuest Facebook page at facebook.com slash Media. Send an email to technology at sqpn.com. Visit the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord. And uh, you can find links from our discussion and our picks of the week on our show notes at starquest.fm slash TEC 252. That's the show number. Be sure to follow the Secrets of Tech in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn, in your favorite podcast app or at the StarQuest YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Media, where you should make sure to hit the bell to get notifications. And until next time, Jack Barazzini, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of technology. Thanks, Tom. Thomas Sanjuro, thank you as well. Been great. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the Secrets of Technology on StarQuest. Quest.